Hello everybody and welcome to this video where we are going to find out what it takes to leave a legacy as a poet or as a writer. I don't know the answer yet. Okay, and this question comes to Ash from Adam. And he asks, here's a question that might be worth exploring. Is the strength of a poet's legacy dependent on the personality slash image they project as a person. Now, the yes is a really interesting question because, okay, he did say poet's legacy. So we are going to look strictly at poets. And I think there are going to be some caveats or disqualifications, if you will, for some of the people that I'm thinking about. Because just like... Like Matthew Buckley Smith said, when we had a conversation sort of like this on either my show or his show, I can't remember. He was saying like how really good poets get forgotten every year, like each year that goes on. Um, that's kind of like the last year that somebody is remembered. And for the longest time, what you have to know is that the reason why there is a canon or the reason why there is any kind of thing that brings people into the consciousness of the culture is because of two things. One, because if critics who are worth a damn put them into the canon, and two, if universities are teaching those books and those authors and those poets. From there, usually that will trickle down into high school if high school deems that that book is okay to teach. But seriously, the thing that has kept all of these ancient fuckers in our mind and in our scope of reading are these things. Two things are happening right now. One is the fact that critics day by day mean less and less than they did, okay? And this is something that I've talked about on shows before. People aren't running to the New Yorker to find out what so-and-so thinks of so-and-so's work. They're looking on Goodreads and Rotten Tomatoes kind of stuff. Like, it's that mindset. There used to be a period where critics meant something, and that was before everyday people had a voice that they could post a star rating on something. Like, critical analysis, as years go on, will probably fade and fade and fade and fade. And there will obviously still be people who fight for those things and strive for the good old days, but their numbers and numbers will dwindle and dwindle and dwindle and whatever. It's fine. It's how society is moving. With the internet being the internet, there is really a smaller push for that. The second thing is, I'm not 100%, but I'm pretty sure university enrollments and higher education enrollments are getting smaller and smaller every year. And on top of that, with all of the book bans that are going on in a lot of states, a lot of books that had been books that people read are not going to be read anymore. However long that goes and however it is, whatever. So with those two things, I really think if you don't have an image or a personality or something, the idea of you being remembered after you're gone is going to be smaller and smaller and smaller. And that sounds fucking horrific, and I'm sorry. But I'm trying to look at it from the sense of if we lose higher education and we lose the critics, what does that leave us with? It leaves us with social media. And I'm trying to think of other things it could leave us with, and I'm, I can't think of anything off the top of my head. Social influencers are going to be the new critics. They're the new critics now. You know what I'm saying? So if your social media standing, your clout score, if that's still a fucking thing, if that doesn't have a whole lot, you better fucking hope to God that somebody who has a lot of 
social media poll falls in love with your work. But like this came up back when I was talking to Bucks. I'm like, so if Sylvia didn't take a header in the stove, would we still know who she is right now? And I think that's, um, and he was like, well, yeah, she was good looking and talented. You know, I'm sure he didn't say it exactly like that, Bucks. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to call you out like that. For instance, and this might me, me, be me talking shit, but if Sylvia Plath took a header in the oven a hundred years before that, I don't know if anyone would know who she is. I think it's still kind of relevant and the salaciousness of media was just getting started. Um, I mean, yes, I think there's been like scandal sheets and shit like that since the 20s, probably before nationwide spread of information that quickly. And I think Hollywood, even though these people aren't Hollywood people, obviously, I think the infatuation with Hollywood really turned the arts into a circus if that makes any sense like all art because at that point i feel like yes there were like famous actors who did stage plays but you could go see that stage play anywhere and it would be by different people and it's all good but now there's movies where someone's on the screen like as big as a fucking building you know And people begin to idolize stuff. So I think that's when the real idolization of celebrity came. Going into all this stuff, if Sylvia Plath didn't kill herself, I think her work would still hold up. But I don't know if people would read her work outside of academia after that, after her death. You know, like maybe she just like died of old age. Just stayed alive, didn't write anymore, and just died. It's like Neil Young, dude. It's better to burn out than to fade away. You know what I'm saying? It's like the other thing I had, I'm like, Bukowski is a really good example of this. But Bukowski became super big, not because of his poetry, but because of his articles. That's what put him over the top. And then the short stories and then the poems that he had been doing before that he was already like a name in the underground poetry scene but that doesn't break you out outside of that the thing that broke him out was his articles and the things that he said in those articles and the stuff he wrote in the nudie mags you know because that was salacious and crazy shit and that's how he got a lot of his reputation if you read a lot of his poetry it's way tame compared to the stuff he wrote in notes of a dirty old man and just his short stories from like south and no north and shit like that and tales of ordinary madness i'm thinking too of like the modernists the modernists are kind of a weird thing and when i was talking to andrew from heavy board he was saying that the modernists were kind of like the last big thing that's happened in literature like the last big event and i'm like what are you talking about dude there was the beats there was the confessional poets there's the meat poets and i'm probably the only one who gives a shit about the meat poets but whatever and then there was like the the language poets and all this other shit but if the modernists were the ones to really change from like the romantic period the romantics and shit all of these other things are just little offshoots of the modernists then i get it i understand that but i'm like thinking of ezra pound and t.s Eliot, and i'm like what's their deal like ezra pound did a lot of behind the scenes stuff that i don't know if people outside of academia would ever have known and i don't know if his stuff was good enough and I do air quotes here, good enough to be talked about if it wasn't for the scandal, like the, you know, fascism, insanity, fill in the blank. And T.S. Eliot, he, I think, this is going to sound pretty fucked up. And I'm getting, I'm, I say this all the time, I'm tired of fucking arguing this kind of shit. But... And I wanted to do a video about this, but I've always hated The Wasteland because of what it did to poetry. I feel like The Wasteland took what Walt Whitman did, where Walt Whitman gave poetry to the people and all this other shit, to the everyday average man. And T.S. Eliot's like, "Uh, I don't like that. I'm going to fucking do something um, and make it really 
uppity and obscure and hard to understand and then tell people how hard it is to understand and make up things of what it means so people will think about it. So I feel like T.S. Eliot became this thing that academia and the upper crust snooty elite could like look up to and go, God damn, that guy did it. Look at him. I like the cut of his jib. I'm going to invite him over for croquette. You know what I'm saying? So in that sense, I feel like if, I feel like if T.S. Eliot, oh, and the reason why I say this is because I found an article of the Wasteland about the Wasteland from a critic when it came out, and the critic annihilated it. Because I always thought that the Wasteland and T.S. Eliot were like this, like it was like built in a factory or built in a laboratory where um, academia critics, the publishing company. All got together and tried to figure out like how can we make this the most influential thing that ever happened no it doesn't turn out it's like that at all like critics didn't fucking like it but he just was so <laughs> and up his own ass that people who want to feel like that gravitated towards it and everyone's gonna fucking argue with me about it i don't give a shit it's just my opinion suck it um, but so in that sense, I feel like his the the mythos he built around the wasteland and how up his own ass he was about it made him what he was. And like, I, I understand like before and after and all this other shit. I don't give a shit. That's what he's known for now. OK, so that's what I'm going off of. But like Walt Whitman's another example, like. Walt Whitman basically, I mean, he had his shorter stuff, but honestly, he like kind of made his bones and made his name over constant rewrites of Leaves of Grass, you know, and self publishing. And I think just writing about the things that he wrote about, the way he wrote them. Again, when I was talking to Andrew, we were talking about Ginsburg and we were saying how like like Ginsburg never wrote anything as good as Howell. But the one thing Ginsburg knew how to do was find the fucking camera lens and find his light. He's like, oh, is there? Hey, uh, I could talk about this. Hey, like have me on your show and I'll, I'll talk about this. Hey, are there going to be cameras there? Let's talk about this. He was a brilliant promoter brilliant you know and i don't know if the beats would have lasted as long as they did if it wasn't for the obscenity trial of howl and naked lunch young death always fucking brings light to shit um kerouac uh cassidy the the all that shit and then again with sylvia plath and all this shit all that stuff brings that shit out john berryman would dream songs be as highly regarded today if Berryman didn't kill himself. Probably, but you don't know. You know what I'm saying? A lot of times, the media, I guess is the best way to put it, really glamorizes struggle when it comes to suicide and artists. And especially fucking Hollywood, dude. If an artist commits suicide, guess who's going to be fucking making a movie about that? You know what I'm saying? Because it's the internal struggle you know i don't really know a positive way to spin this because i think the period of the world that we are in is so different than anything that happened before 10 or 15 years ago that we are in the transition stage critics matter schooling matters like th these things we say matters because they we were told when we were young that these things mattered and i don't think they really do anymore and i think another five years another 10 years you're gonna see it less and less and less so making any kind of splash or i don't even think you have to make a splash as much as you just have to have consistency in your like presence online I, that sounds so fucking stupid and i want to like make myself vomit on myself for saying it but this is the world we live in unless the internet fucking blows up tomorrow and like 
I don't know, like all the power in the world goes out, I don't see anything changing anytime soon. I think it's just going to get worse. So find yourself a Kim Kardashian to promote your fucking poetry book. That's the best thing I could say about it. Which reminds me, I need to make a note to have a Kim Kardashian type like my poetry book. Hmm. That's something to think about. Thank you, Adam. I just want to add a couple things to this right here. I'm editing this video right now. What I've been doing the last few weeks is kind of finalizing what the contracts are going to look like for people who get their stuff put out by Poetic Anarchy Press. And through listening to me talk about this stuff, as if I wasn't there when I was saying it, but when I was listening back to it, there was something that kind of stuck out to me. I basically said that the two ways people are remembered and their work is remembered is it being pushed by critics or academia. And now the third thing is social influencers. I feel like I neglected a huge thing that should be one of the big things as to how your work is remembered, and that is by your publisher. And so I thought about that for a minute and was kind of going back and forth in my head about the role of the publisher maintaining their back catalog for posterity. And it got me thinking about City Lights, for one. Now, I don't know every contractual obligation City Lights has, but I do know that out of its Pocket Poet series, a lot of the books in the Pocket Poet series have not been printed lately, or whatever. Many of the people whose books had come out, at some point or another, have gone out of print. Even ones who I think would be able to garner the attention based off of their name. So that tells me that their the rights for that work had some sort of time limit on it. You're allowed to print X amount of copies of this book or you are allowed to print this book for X amount of years wherein the rights revert back to the poet or whatever. And I really feel like that sucks because, for one, when you think of City Lights, you're going to, and you picture the Pocket Poets books, you're going to think of that first Ferlinghetti book, you're going to think of Howl, or you're going to think of Lunch Poems by Frank O'Hara. Now, if City Lights didn't have the lifelong rights to Howl, I'm sure another company would have put it out. I'm sure there are copies of Howl put out by other companies, but the iconic black and white Howl book has been a constant for 50 fucking years plus, okay? And I think that's really important. Another thing that I know that happens is that there are publishers who have rights for books in perpetuity. But then if those companies get bought by a, a bigger company, or if the company merges in with another company, the poet either gets the, their work back or the writer gets their work back, or they have to renegotiate a new contract when that happens. And I think this is fucked for a couple reasons. One, because I feel like if the poet gets their work back, but then isn't like pushing to find another publisher for that work, then that work, as soon as that book is completely out of print, is going to be like forgotten to the ages. And I think that's how a lot of poets become forgotten. Like, let's say a publisher buys a small press that has put out like 100 poets, but 20 of those poets, since their books have come out, have died and their families aren't really that knowledgeable about what the fuck is supposed to happen once the rights are back to them. You know what I'm saying? Or maybe they didn't like the poet's work and are glad that it's out of print, you know? So there's that problem. I think if it's a situation where the new publisher decides that they don't want to put out the person's book or they have like two years or three years to um, reprint the work, then it should just stay because it keeps the book in the 
forefront of people's minds. Like, I think the biggest reason why we lose great poets and great writers is because the great poet and the great writer dies. And the people who have the rights to their stuff don't know what the fuck to do with it. Or the writer or poet didn't make a real will of any kind. And so now nobody knows what the fuck to do with anything. So this video, this question from Adam, has made me put a clause in poetic anarchy contracts for this total fucking reason which is going to be that poetic anarchy when we put a book out the poems themselves are the rights of those are retained by the poet and they can do whatever the fuck they want with them but the actual collection that poetic anarchy press puts out is a collection that poetic poetic anarchy press can do whatever the fuck they want with for perpetuity on any platform because we don't know in 70 years from now people might be reading thought books like who fucking knows what the fuck is going to happen we want to do that and honestly it's just to make sure that the catalog stays alive and the people we put out that happens to and then if something happens and i die one day or i'm too old to run it and a company buys Poetic Anarchy Press, I think I want to put something in there too that the new publisher has X amount of time to keep putting the stuff out unless like, I mean, I, I can't necessarily make a contract of what another company is going to do, but maybe like they could have a first right refusal or something like that. That seems fair. I just don't want books to go out of print. I don't want books to disappear into, like, nothingness. You know what I'm saying? Like, especially the people that I'm putting out right now. I think the people I'm putting out right now are people who need to be read for the next 500 fucking years. You know what I'm saying? So I don't want anything to happen to those people's works, you know? So I think um, if we go back to this, the, the legacy of the writer or the poet is going to first fall on the poet, then the publisher, then the social influencers, and probably last but last but least until they are extinct critics and academics. So I hope this was helpful. If it was, like this motherfucking video, type hard everybody, and I'll talk to you all later. I just want to give a quick thanks to those people who make these videos possible. Anarchy Crew and my followers on Patreon. I appreciate the hell out of you guys. Thank you so much for keeping me going to keep this content possible. You guys are awesome. And if you'd like to join the crew of the Anarchy Crew, just hit the join button beneath this video. And if you'd like to become a member of my Patreon, you can run over to the link down below to do that as well. Thank you.